Good. All right, well, hello, good evening, and welcome. I'm Mark Pinto at Phoenixville Public Library, and welcome to tonight's presentation on, uh, well, something that the Phoenixville is famous for, Phoenixville famous for, for many things, but long before the blob came to town, uh, Phoenixville was well known for the attractive Majolica pottery that was produced here. And tonight we welcome Jack Ertel from this area to highlight for us this aspect of Phoenixville's history. We ask you to hold your questions until the end of Jack's presentation. And at that time, you can put your question in the chat or unmute yourself. Jack, welcome. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to put some uh, images up on the screen. And I hope everybody doesn't mind hearing a voiceover. But uh, this may be the, uh, the best way for everybody to follow what's going on. But uh, Phoenixville is uh, primarily in its history known, of course, as an industrial community that was uh, significant for iron and steel production. But there were other industries and businesses here as well through the years. Uh, the Majolica pottery produced here in the 1880s is one of those things that, that seems a little bit far into the iron and steel business, but uh, was an important uh, point of history in our community. And uh, the Historical Society has a rather large collection of locally produced uh, pottery. And uh, this presentation will talk a little bit about uh, the company that produced it. Uh, we'll give you some examples of it, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, the people that work there and uh, what ultimately happened to the company. And uh, once again, as Mark just mentioned, we'll ask you to please hold your questions till the end. I'll be glad to answer them. Uh, I may go through some pictures quickly so that we're not here for two hours. Um, Phoenixville is a trust in Majolica pottery. Uh, just a couple of quick things. First of all, uh, Etruscan is purely a device that Phoenixville's company came up with as a advertising gimmick to suggest uh, fine European craftsmanship. So there was no one, uh, as far as we know, that worked at the company that had any connection with the Etruscans of ancient Rome or of uh, Tuscany area of Italy. Uh, the Majolica pottery, of course, is a, a style popular in the late 19th century and into uh, just after the turn of the century. So we're going to talk about the company that was located here in Phoenixville. And uh, for those of you who are watching, and uh, I have a, a deep background in this subject, there may be some collectors here. Uh, this may sound a little bit uh, unnecessary, but for a lot of other people, they wonder exactly what Majolica pottery and Majolica pottery was. This is a good example of it. Uh, it was a highly um, decorative design uh, production of the late 19th century used a lot of uh, imagery that are things in nature. As you look at this uh, picture, you can see a bird and uh, leaves. Uh, Jack, Jack, you're actually not sharing anything. Oh, uh, well, it's, I, got it up <laughs> on the, I got it up on the screen. Uh, maybe you have to open did, did you Did you do share screen? Uh, I thought I had, hang on a sec. Yep. We'll go back again. All righty. I go to my Zoom here. Da, da, da. There we go. Share screen. All right, here we go. Are we up now? Yep, we're up. Uh huh. Okay, there we go. The wonders of technology. <laughs> okay. Well, the only slide anybody missed was this one which is an example of uh, one of the uh, serving dishes that the company produced. And we're gonna come back to that in some of the colors they used um, as we go along. But as I was mentioning, this a style of pottery uh, with a high uh, lustrous sheen to it. That's because of the glazing that was used in the late 19th century. It's part of uh, the Victorian era. It tends to be when people look at it today as either very beautiful or very gaudy. And, uh, uh, you can find all sorts of examples of it. I'm going to talk about Phoenixville production of it, but uh, people need to be aware that it was produced um, 
in many places in the United States, as well as Great Britain and France and Italy and other parts of Europe as well. So it kind of went out of fashion um, in the years uh, leading up to World War I. So uh, here we go. Well, what uh, brought Majolica to the forefront was uh, the Crystal Palace Exposition in 1851. And if uh, anybody watched uh, the PBS program on Queen Victoria, uh, the building of the Crystal Palace and the opening of the exposition, which was the brainchild of uh, Victoria's husband, uh, Prince Albert, uh, was uh, kind of the final focal point of that program. And this was a, what a lot of people consider to be the first World's Fair. And at that exposition, the uh, Minton Company, which was on a major, and this is what the main exhibition hall looked like, according to an artist, companies from all over the world um, showed examples of, of their uh, products to try to stimulate trade. The United States had a lot of uh, exhibits there from American manufacturers as well. But at the uh, exposition, the Minton Company of uh, Stoke-on-Trent area of Britain uh, displayed for the first time what they called Majolica pottery. And this is, an this is one of the pieces they actually put on display. And um, I'm using this picture because um, later on in, what, in the Phoenixville production, you're going to see something that looks similar to this and particularly take note of the base. Um, for some reason, they have those fish have been called dolphins. Um, those of us in Pennsylvania are more likely to call them catfish. But uh, nevertheless, Minton put this on display and this is the kind of the unveiling of the product. And it started to catch on in Europe, although it um, only slowly caught on here in the United States. Uh, but another event in the United States really kind of triggered it. Now let me talk a little bit about the industry in Phoenixville. Phoenixville was basically an iron town, manufactured uh, nails and uh, rails for railroad production, eventually uh, structural iron for building bridges and for building large tall structures like the uh, uh, internal uh, support structures in the uh, Washington Monument, for example. But after the Civil War, um, someone formed a company that eventually turns into what becomes known as Griffin Smith and Hill Pottery. There are, there are several companies that exist. The original one uh, was founded to actually make brick, fire brick, to line the kilns of the Phoenix Ironworks. And uh, they found that the uh, white kaolin uh, clay was uh, very durable for manufacturing the fire bricks. And eventually they branch out into manufacturing pottery. Um, where was the pottery located? Well, if you are a Phoenixville person, uh, this picture may look familiar to you. This is an aerial shot of uh, the 100 block of uh, Bridge Street and 100 block of Church Street in about 1938. And one can see uh, the well-known high and low bridges or the Gay Street Bridge and the Main Street Bridge. Some of the buildings of the Phoenixville uh, Steel Company by that point. But if you call your attention to the uh, open lot area, that area is uh, along Church Street and that open space there is largely where the pottery factory was located. Um, Today, the street looks like this. There's an apartment house on the left-hand side. There is a church just up the street. And right on the corner uh, is an apartment complex for um, senior citizens. Uh, if we go back in history, of course, uh, we find some interesting things. In the 1990s, the borough of Phoenixville was putting new water and sewer lines in that part of town. And they dug a, a pit to begin their excavations and lo and behold, they discovered several strata of debris that had belonged to the pottery in Phoenixville. And uh, we actually had two members of the historical society. Um, police weren't happy about it, but they were lowering a ladder into the pit, climbing down in there at night and retrieving uh, shards that contained pieces of uh, uh, some of the molds that were used, some of the pieces that had been broken and just thrown away. Some were glazed, some were not. We have uh, six huge bins 
uh, of this material that we are still evaluating. And in fact, one of our volunteers just took two of them home to clean uh, yesterday, in fact. So that's where the pottery was located. Here's an 1873 uh, art, artist view of the pottery. And if you look at the number five there, that's Church Street. And you can see um, uh, the kilns uh, clearly shown from the uh, early pottery. This is before Griffin, Smith and Hill. Uh, this is uh, uh, the early pottery company that was located there. And it's uh, parallels uh, Bridge Street in Phoenixville and the French Creek. And you can see uh, the railroad tracks nearby. The early potters started making some uh, items that were not particularly exciting. This is uh, the underside showing the pottery mark of uh, Schreiber's Pottery Company that uh, uh, in the 1870s, uh, one of the other companies that changed the name called themselves the Phoenix Pottery or the Phoenixville Pottery. And they would just etch their uh, name on the bottom of pieces that they made. There's one that's uh, somebody really tried to get very fancy, but it's still scratched through. Um, in the early years, they made uh, whiteware look like this uh, with decorative designs, but it's still basically a, a, a white uh, whiteware. There's a couple others from our collection um, as well. But uh, the big thing that sets off Phoenix Hill's production of uh, Majolica pottery takes place following the Centennial Exposition in Fairmount Park, Philadelphia in 1876. Uh, Minton had a large exhibit. Uh, unfortunately, there's no cover photography in 1876. And so this is a, a black and white photo of part of their uh, setup in the, the pavilion uh, in Philadelphia in Fairmount Park. And uh, a number of companies began to manufacture the Jolica, thinking it would become popular in the United States following what in essence is the first World's Fair held in the United States. Uh, in 1879, uh, the pottery company that existed gets reorganized. There were several of these companies over the years. They were all partnerships. So people would come and go, uh, others would invest in it, but they're not corporations that sold stock. And in 1879, uh, a new partnership was formed called Griffin, Smith, and Hill, uh, initially to manufacture earth, white earthenware, but then they branch out and begin to manufacture uh, Majolica. Uh, where Griffin, Smith, and Hill comes from, it's actually a partnership of four people. Uh, Griffin is actually the last name of two brothers. Uh, George Griffin and Henry Griffin. Uh, they were the sons of uh, the Mr. Griffin, who is famous in the Phoenix area as the superintendent of the Phoenix uh, Iron Works, who also happened to be the inventor of the uh, three inch ordnance rifle, which was a famous uh, uh, light artillery piece uh, used during the Civil War. And uh, that, that man's name was John Griffin. And his two sons, uh, George and, and Harry, his official name was Henry, but he went by Harry. Uh, they had recently graduated from uh, Rensselaer Polytech up in New York, and he was looking for a business for them to get involved with. So he underwrote them forming a partnership with two veteran pottery makers. Uh, the other two people are David Smith, who was the, basically the pottery foreman, and William Hill, who was the lead potter. Both uh, Smith and Hill were immigrants from Great Britain. And in fact, they had both come from the pottery industry in the Stoke-on-Trent Stoke, Stoke -on -Trent region of Great Britain and had a lot of experience in it. Uh, so in 1879, they formed this partnership. Uh, the Griffins are the youngest members of this, uh, the one brother is 24, the other one is only 20 years of age, and they knew next to nothing about pottery, but they are the uh, money people behind this. So um, they set out to manufacture pottery. And what happens is they announce this to the world. This is the front page of the Phoenixville newspaper from uh, 1879 announcing the formation of the company 
and they're going to produce white earthenware, et cetera, et cetera. Um, sounds like a very humble beginning. Well, what happens is uh, the Griffin brothers, and when you look at photographs that have survived, um, they look like the Smith brothers from the cough rock drop fame rather than the Griffin brothers, but this is George and Harry. Um, and we're going to talk about them in a little bit. Here, this is what David Smith looked like um, when he was a little later in life. Uh, we do not have a photograph of William Hill. And in fact, ironically, Hill was only a member of this partnership for about a year. And I think he was dissatisfied with some things. And he left Phoenixville to go work in a pottery in Trenton, New Jersey uh, by 1881. Uh, David Smith had been the uh, uh, supervisor or, or foreman of a pottery factory in uh, New Brunswick, Canada, and he had been dissatisfied up there. And so he came from there to, to Trenton and then eventually to Phoenix. And that's he stayed there until he, he passed away. Um, so they were initially very successful in their product. This is a, an excerpt from uh, the local newspaper in 1884. And you get an idea of the, the size of their building, a two-story building, uh, three kilns, a mill building, uh, additional uh, buildings and facilities. So they were very proud of their, of their product uh, that they made and, and what, what they did as a, a business. They grew fairly rapidly. Um, in 1880, uh, they had about 74 employees. Uh, given the, what the predecessor companies, which were much smaller, had, uh, for example, in 1870, uh, the earlier companies had about 30 to 35 workers. So this is a significant increase. As the 80s go on, um, they top 100 in the number of employees. But things come and go, and by the time um, they go out of business, there are um, less than 20 workers at the pottery. So uh, this is what their complex looked like by 1886. This is a shot from a, uh, an excerpt from a, a tax map produced, and you can see where it says Griffin Smith and Company. Mr. Hill left, and they started calling themselves Griffin Smith and Company, but they still used Griffin Smith and Hill on all their imprints that they did on their pottery. And the reason for that is they were pretty shrewd businessmen and they liked the symbol they came up for Griffin Smith and Hill, which I'll show you in a moment. But they also advertised the GSH as standing for good, strong, and handsome. So they were they were pretty slick in their, their idea of advertising um, their products. And you can see. Uh, the kilns here and within the buildings. We uh, have a couple photographs that have survived. Here, here are two of the, the striped bottle kilns. And if you look really carefully on this uh, damaged photograph, uh, what you'll see is you can see the some of the workmen standing at the bottom of the, the kiln that's on the left as you look at it. And so you get a sense of the size. Of course, the way they uh, they baked the pottery, of course, it was stacked in the kilns. So, um, and sometimes according to some accounts, they would be been stacked 25 or 26 uh, stacks high. And they're always worried about something tipping over and ruining a lot of their work. Um, here's another shot shows uh, some of their kilns that were enclosed. The enclosed nature of some of the kilns eventually is part of the downfall of the company. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, here's a copy of uh, what their business card looked like when they started manufacturing uh, Etruscan products, or what they call Etruscan products, and uh, Griffin Smith and Company. Well, what puts them on the map is in 1884, uh, there is the equivalent of a trade fair or world's fair in New Orleans, Louisiana. It was called the, the uh, World Cotton Exposition. This is a, a sketch of what the uh, main building looked like in New Orleans. And uh, the company entered some of their products in competition down there. And they won the gold medal in the pottery category. Uh, by the way, this building doesn't exist anymore. 
but there is a park in New Orleans. It's still called Exposition Park, but none of the buildings have survived. Well, this is the, the gold medal winning items that they produced. Um, they eventually did not mass produce them, but these are show pieces. And uh, as you look at this, what you can see is they're uh, built around the basic design of uh, what they believed to be was the canteen of a continental soldier. So you have the great seal of the United States in the center, uh, a lot of ruffles and flourishes with uh, gilding. And of course, if you look at the picture in the center, uh, the spout is a, a continental soldier with a tricorn hat. Uh, if you will look at a, a reverse photo of these three pieces, um, the other side, the center is in gold with the white relief. So uh, fortunately, the um, great granddaughter of the designer of this piece donated them to us. So we actually have these original uh, award-winning pieces on display in our, in our museum. Uh, we won't talk about what their value is. Um, here's one of their advertising flyers from 1884, uh, in which they promote not only what they sell, but where their location was. Phoenixville is located on the Philadelphia and Reading and Pennsylvania Schuylkill Valley Railroads, 27 and a half miles north of Philadelphia. Uh, that was important because the company was not a retail company. They mass produced their products for uh, resale by others. And one of the things that happened at that exposition in uh, New Orleans was a number of businesses took an interest in their products and decided that they would buy them in bulk and use them as premium giveaways to people that purchased their product. Uh, the best example of that is um, uh, the founder of the A and P T company, which becomes Atlantic and Pacific, which becomes A and P Markets. And uh, there's some historians complain that uh, it was part of the demise of the company because they kind of glutted the market, giving so many of these things away as premium items. Um, here's some of the products that they made, and I just. I'm going to walk through these fairly quickly just to give you some examples. Uh, first of all, when we did the excavations, uh, and it wasn't me, but it was two of my predecessors, uh, we came across some of the molds that were used. Uh, we have some of those on display um, in our museum. Uh, you can see uh, uh, one of the molds for a corn dish and uh, two molds for, for handles for uh, some of the pieces. And we have, of course, have Others that are broken, and we just uh, in cleaning the other day, we discovered a portion of a corn pattern that's that's about twice that big. So we have some of those on display. Uh, but they made some interesting pieces, and they made some typical ones. This is one of their most unique ones. It was uh, designed by a lady in Norristown, Pennsylvania. It's a baptismal vessel in 1883, and the uh, top half of the vessel actually lifts off, and the bottom holds uh, the holy water for baptism. Uh, and this was produced in uh, limited quantities. Uh, here's what it looks like uh, with the uh, two pieces separated. Uh, very, very well done. All of these things, of course, were hand painted and baked more than once in order to put the glaze on them and the paints, et cetera. Uh, so everything was hand painted primarily by uh, women that worked at the factory. Um, some of the brilliant colors were um, colors that the company kept really uh, very secretive about. Uh, a lot of it were, were metal based, for example. Um, the green color included uh, copper oxide grindings that were part of the, the pigment that they use. And uh, they used cobalt oxide for blue and uh, they used other colors they, for yellow and red, and et cetera. So um, they were pretty clever about what they did. Uh, as I said, each piece was hand painted. So what you will see is the same design show up in multiple uh, colors. So these are two plates that are uh, basically identical 
except they're painted differently. Uh, and this is the, their famous um, seashell and seaweed and coral pattern. They did, they produced all sorts of things in this pattern, including um, spittoons or cuspidors. Uh, here's another one of their examples this is the sunflower pattern of uh, uh, two syrup jugs. And they also had a small plate or dish that um, it would sit in. And once again, these are uh, hand painted, so no two are exa exactly alike. Uh, bamboo pattern was also extremely popular. And this is the, the same set uh, with the difference between a white and a blue background. And you can see a lot of that. We have examples of uh, some of the color variations in our museum. Here's a buried dish, for example, that's multicolored, as is the next one, but has a blue background. It gives it uh, a much different look, as you can see. Um, here are some of the other items that are in the bamboo pattern, uh, which was very popular. And we have a full set of those on display. Here's an example of uh, much of the uh, seashell and seaweed pattern uh, that they have. Uh, one of the more interesting pieces, and it doesn't show well, is the um, what looks like a cup and saucer on the top shelf. Um, that's actually a mustache cup, and it has a a uh, small bar that runs across it so that gentlemen, as they drank their coffee, did not get the cream in their mustaches. Um, uh, when we take students through, we always ask them to take a look at it. Uh, what did they think they used it for? And once they find out that, I said, there's one other thing about it you need to know. Um, it was made in the 19th century and you had to be right-handed in order to use it uh, because that's the side of the, you had to hold it in your right hand in order for it to work. And it's, it's always believed to be improper in that area to be left-handed. Uh, very, very decorative pieces, very colorful. Um, certain colors they were famous for. Uh, here's a, an example, this is a, a sunflower spittoon. Um, when it was donated to us, we made sure that it had not previously been used. Uh, but we have about five different spittoons in our collection. Uh, here's a, uh, like a, in effect, like a cake, cake dish in a cauliflower pattern uh, with cauliflower leaves and cauliflower in the center. And um, this is one of their um, really uh, beautiful pieces. This is a, a teapot uh, using the corn pattern. And uh, these are fairly difficult to find in, in, in good shape because uh, the spout tended to be quite delicate and would break off. And sometimes the handles would break off as well. And, and we've had pieces donated to us where the, the teapot lid is missing. And, uh, you have a big chip on the spout, but this is uh, one of the best pieces in our collection. And uh, this is a, a dish for covering or a cover of, a, uh, of cheese decorative design with a, with a swan on the top. Um, there's another dish, uh, pear, pears and strawberries, and uh, another one, a uh, pitcher, for example, with flower pattern on it. And they also made some interesting items. There's a, a, the mustard pot on your left. Uh, the mustard pot, uh, the photo can give you a false impression. Uh, that little mustard pot is about two and a half inches in height. And the swan paperweight on the right-hand side is about uh, three and a half inches in diameter and about uh, uh, three inches high at the, the top of the swan. But there's some good examples of what they produced. Uh, here's a, a box to, 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 put sard to serve sardines to people in. Uh, you'll notice in the things I was showing you, they all came from nature, uh, plants and flowers and leaves. Uh, Etc. Very few of what they produced depicted people. This is a good example of their most well-known piece that showed people. This is a cider jug, and um, we have several in different colors. The one in the center, as you can see, is uh, painted uh, in multiple colors. The others are all uh, monochromatic. But if you look at them uh, on 
one side of the pitcher, there are two baseball players. And on the other side are um, two boys playing soccer. That's interesting is this is a, an imitation of what Wedgwood produced, a similar um, jug, except on Wedgwood's, as I mentioned on the, the caption here, uh, they still featured soccer players or football players, as they would call them in Britain. And instead of baseball, the boys were playing cricket. Uh, but it's a good example of another thing. Uh, people who worked in these pottery factories in this era, um, they would steal designs or should I say, uh, politely imitate one another. And somebody would work in a place for a couple of years, um, have a design in their head and they migrate to another potter somewhere else out in Ohio or in Trenton, New Jersey, which were two of the centers for uh, Majolica making in that time period. And so there was a lot of uh, imitation and duplication. Um, here's the, those fish again. And this is called a, a dolphin compote, or comport actually, it's a typing error. But um, this is uh, the piece that the workers hated making. Uh, in the 1930s, a reporter for the local newspaper uh, had a, a series of articles that he wrote weekly uh, that are kind of then and now articles. And uh, he uh, settled upon the idea of going back and by the 1930s, a lot of the people that did the painting and worked at the pottery were now um, uh, later in life. And he went and interviewed several of those people and he wrote about eight or nine articles describing what work was like at the pottery. And the first thing that comes through in the interviews is, in his, in his articles are that many of these pieces, they hated making because some of these pieces, they were paid by piecework and it didn't take much for a piece to be broken and all the work you've done for naught. This piece was hated because the, in effect, what looks like teeth, the edges that run around the top of this had a tendency to break off. Uh, so uh, people did not like making this at all. Uh, uh, when we acquired this piece, one of the people that helped us acquire it said he was glad to support us acquiring it, but it was the ugliest thing he had ever donated money for. Um, he's probably uh, rolling over in his grave right now because this piece is gonna be in an international exhibit in September. So uh, perhaps uh, the maker from the 1880s is getting the last laugh. Um, how do you identify Phoenixville's Etruscan Majolica? Well, they designed a pottery mark that shows the letters GSH entwined with a circle identifying Etruscan Majolica. Initially, this is the first pottery mark they used of GSH. And it is the letters GSH um, superimposed on one another. Um, and you won't find these on every piece that they produced, but you'll find it on most of the pieces that they produced. Eventually, um, they would produce uh, a second stamp that would say Etruscan on it. Uh, and then later on, and this is a piece that was donated to us, and somebody was using it as a planter and they poked a hole in the bottom so uh, water can get out eventually, set it in the dip. And this is the, the probably the most famous design imprint that the company used. Uh, the Etruscan Majolica with the two stars and GSH um, in the center. However, not everything had these marks on it. And so one of the other ways to help identify uh, Griffin Smith and Hill pieces is uh, there were certain colors that um, they were noted for. One of which is this pinkish purple color that they used uh, on the interior of many of their products that they produced. Um, they called it orchid pink. Uh, and they had a secret formula for producing the pigment. Um, let's talk a little bit about the workers for a couple of minutes and I will take some questions. We have some photographs that have survived that show uh, working conditions there. And, uh, and these are some of the yard workers. Uh, 
And these are some of the pottery yard workers. You'll notice there's a couple of teenage boys in the group. Uh, a lot of the workers were immigrants or the children of immigrants. We've got another picture. Um, what would happen is the boys were called clay boys and they would mix the ground up clay with water to produce the dough-like uh, material. And then it would go into a, a pug or a clay press that squeezed the excess water out before that it would either be shaped or put in a mold. Now we have a photograph from the 1880s uh, that shows some of the workers. And I always like to point out to some of our visitors, if you look at the first row, these are all young boys, roughly um, 10 to 13 years of age. And this is the age of child labor. And uh, one of the, of course, uh, phrases of the late 19th century, when there were virtually no child labor laws, was why hire an adult for a dollar when you can hire a kid for a dime? And so um, a lot of families, particularly immigrant families who were kind of living on the edge, um, their children would go to uh, grade school through third or fourth grade till they thought they could read or write. And then they would quit school and work in a mill someplace. Uh, the average worker at the mill worked 7 a.m. to 6 p.m six days a week. Uh, the average salary was about $5. The boys got even less. The painters got more than that because they were paid piecework. Um, we have some shots that have survived, uh, donated to us by some descendants of some of the potters at work, fortunately. Um, and here's, here's once again, the Griffin brothers with their female employees. And a lot of the female employees where the painters, um, they were called paintresses, not painters, but paintresses. And uh, here's some paintresses in the front row here. And they were paid uh, piecework. And uh, some of the examples that show that uh, uh, because of their skill, they could get, uh, make sometimes double the average weekly wage. But people weren't paid particularly well. Um, uh, if you want a scary statistic, those of you who are math scholars out there, um, in 1880, the total salary for 74 employees was $27,555 a year. Now, if you divide that by 74, the 27555 it works out to about $2.50 a day. Now that's the people that are paid the top salary, maybe the bookkeeper, the plant manager, et cetera. And then you have children who are being paid 25 cents a day. So um, it really isn't, isn't a great place salary wise, but that's typical of America in the late 19th century. One of the real gems we have is the uh, we have a copy that was handed to, donated to us by the, the son-in-law of David Smith. And that's the actual formula book for uh, where they came up for the colors and uh, how the original glazes were formed. And when you go through the book and we've uh, we scanned the entire thing and somebody stops in our museum, you can look at the scans of it, uh, how much of it are, are metal-based particles. And in fact, one of the dangers for the workers in and around the kilns is that the final glazing is, uh, uses metal, metal particles. And so you run the risk of uh, respiratory ailments from breeze, breathing in the fumes uh, during the, during the uh, process in the kilns. Um, a lot of them are lead coated, uh, but, but when, they, when they're fully baked, they're not harmful. Uh, the company produced a catalog in 1884 of their uh, products. And a lot of companies used the catalog to bulk purchase things. And one of the belief is that it eventually produces a glut on the market. Uh, one of our members in the 1960s, before we actually were founded as a group, uh, had the catalog reproduced and we do have them available for purchase at our society. But these are some examples of their products. And uh, some of them you did see uh, some actual photographs of earlier in my presentation. Um, a number of companies sold 
uh, bought Majolica products and then gave them away. Here's the Silver Star Baking Powder Company of Dayton, Ohio. Um, they were giving away Majolica products as uh, premiums. Remember, you get one of the foregoing lists with every one pound can you buy of our baking powder. Uh, now, what brings the company to its demise? In December of 1890, a fire struck the factory. And the source of it's unknown, but once again, if you think back on the, one of those early photographs, you had uh, three of the kilns that are encased in a building. Not maybe the safest thing to do. And uh, the, the main factory building was destroyed. This was a quote from the uh, Westchester, Pennsylvania newspaper uh, in this, the day after in 1890. Uh, the company went out of business for a period of time tried to um, reopen later. Uh, they got hampered by the fact that George Griffin um, died of a heart attack. And so he wasn't around. He was one of the guiding business figures of the company. And uh, uh, that's, a, that's a strike too, so to speak. So the company opened uh, after the fire under different names. The reason for that is uh, when they had to close because of the fire, the uh, level of indebtedness exceeded both their insurance and the assets that they had. So they actually had to shut down their partnership and form a new partnership with new money. And they operated under a couple different names over the, the next dozen years or so. But in 1902, they finally sold, uh, the land was sold, sold off, kilns were demolished um, before 1910. Most, most of it, the factory was gone by 1903. Um, here's some of the pottery marks from some of the later productions. Chester Pottery Company was the last one and actually should have been Chester County, not Chester Pottery Company. Um, I mentioned a couple of things about the Historical Society. For those of you that aren't from the Phoenix area, if you come into town, this is our building. It's a former church and our entrance is where you can see the flag there. Uh, our museum is on the lower level. It is handicapped accessible. We have a room dedicated to our pottery collection. We have about 300 plus pieces in our collection, uh, most donated from some uh, local private collectors. And uh, we have about 140 pieces on display. And uh, now that the pandemic is uh, starting to be slowly conquered, we are back in operation. And if anybody wants to come in and take a look at these items and talk with one of our, our volunteers, uh, we are now open on Wednesdays and Fridays from nine in the morning to uh, three o'clock in the afternoon. And we are at 204 Church Street in Phoenixville. Um, you can go to our website. Uh, you look just look up Phoenixville Area Historical Society and there's a, a, a short history of the company posted on it and some, some photographs, some different than the ones that you've seen in the presentation. I also wanted to mention another thing. Um, three years ago, there was a major display in the planning stages of Majolica. And it was to be called Majolica Mania. And it has been on the shelf for over a year and a half. It was supposed to open um, in the fall of 2019. Uh, we became a partner in it. Uh, we have donated pictures. We have donated uh, a couple of pieces from our collection and they've all been in storage ever since, but it is finally coming to pass. And this major exhibit will open this September at the Bard Graduate Center in New York City. And it'll run from September to January. And then in January, it'll be taken down and it will move on to Baltimore, where it'll be at the Walters Art Museum. Uh, there's plans that when it's finished at the Walters, it is likely to be going to a museum in Cincinnati, Ohio for um, four or five months. And then it's going to hopefully go across the pond, as they say, to the potteries industry area, Stoke-on-Trent, and to the a museum called the Potteries in Great Britain, 
for another six months. So we have lent a couple pieces and we may not get them back for a while, but we are very pleased to be able to participate in this. So um, that's a summary of our, our presentation. And uh, I hope you uh, learned some things. I would be glad, Mark, to uh, field any questions people have. And uh, there we go. I will uh, end my uh, share here. So I'm back on screen again. And I'd be glad to take any questions anybody has. Feel free to unmute or share in the chat. He was like, that's all right. <laughs> that was great, Jack. Uh, love seeing those photos. Well, I thank you for the opportunity. You know, uh, the world has been um, heavily shut down because of COVID-19 and justifiably so, of course. But um, as, as a historical organization, uh, you, you want to have what you do out there for the world to know what you are doing and what you have for people to see. So uh, we are glad that we are back in operation. If somebody does come on a Wednesday or, or a Friday right now, um, they're going to see our doors shut, but it says, uh, we're open, ring the bell, and uh, somebody will come and let you in. We're just trying to control uh, the flow. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we, we actually had um, 80 students from uh, one of our local elementary schools uh, get tour, and we had them under a tent up on our lawn and had examples of pieces to show them because uh, we couldn't take groups of 20 through our museum yet because it's too small to handle that large a number. But um, if, if a, a couple of people showed up at the door, one of our volunteers would be glad to give you a tour. So um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, Jack. Can you see them? Um, let me switch over and take a quick look. Okay. Uh, my mom has pieces. Who can I contact to look at them? Well, that's a good question. Um, we as an organization, um, do not do appraisals. Um, if somebody lives locally and they'd want to bring in a piece for us to look at to try to help them determine, is it uh, a Phoenixville made piece? Uh, we would be glad to, to do that. Um, the key thing is take a look at the bottom and see if it has uh, that GSH mark on the bottom. And if it does, you do have a genuine Griffin Smith and Hill piece. There are knockoffs that have been produced, but they don't have the GSH piece, the uh, that um, seashell and seaweed and coral plate that you saw earlier in my presentation. We found replicas of those produced in Portugal in the 1890s. And uh, on eBay, about two years ago, you could buy a full set of them made in Japan. Now, in, in neither instance did they have the GSH mark on the back. And of course, anything that old is, is usually going to have uh, the cracking on it uh, as the glazing has dried over the years. But um, if you're interested in having something appraised, I would go to a reputable antique dealer and ask them to take a look at it. Uh, if you're just trying to get a general idea of what kind of value something has, it is incredible how many Griffin, Smith, and Hill or Etruscan majority pieces you can find posted on eBay and you can get a sense. And if, if you're an eBay person, you can actually find out what kind of prices people actually realize on those things. Um, how often do, you, do people find these pieces in Chester County? Well, that's an interesting question. We have people walk in the door with them, Mark. Um, I'll, I'll tell you a short little funny story. Um, I did a, a half hour program on this for the school district's uh, community access TV station with another of our members about 10 years ago. And I'm in church the following Sunday and um, a young mom walks up to me and says, hey, I have one of those bowls in our living room. And we've always kept it on the coffee table with M&Ms in it for our children. And my son was kicking a Nerf soccer ball around the living room and just missed hitting that bowl. She said, I saw your show and I put the M&Ms in another bowl and the, the bowl is now on our in our china closet. 
So they do pop up. You can see them in um, antique shops all over the United States because uh, the Atlantic and Pacific Tea Company marketed all over the United States for a period of time. I've seen them in shops down in Tennessee, and I actually saw some in a shop in Wyoming a couple of years ago and in Phoenix. So they do pop up. A lot of them, um, families in and around the Phoenix area will have a piece or two just because it's, it's a piece of history. And also, if you have a piece of Phoenix, so look on the bottom, it may have a number imprinted on it. And that number is actually the number of the person who painted it. That's how they got credit for their work. And um, it's interesting, one of our volunteers that joined us a couple of years ago, we're looking through pieces that we have and um, he looks at the bottom and says, there, there's my great aunt's number. That his great aunt had been the painter of it in the 1880s. I think it was his great great aunt, but anyway, um, you get an example of it. Um, Someone said they weren't aware Phoenix will produce it. I think that's a lot of that's because um, the uh, iron and steel heritage in Phoenix is so strong and people aren't aware of the thing. Uh, would you take the pieces for donations if they're authentic? Oh yeah, we would always be glad to take them, uh, particularly if they're in good condition. Uh, we got a, a donation in the mail uh, about four years ago from somebody in Florida, called us up and said that, their aunt had died and they got stuck with their pottery collection. And some of them are Phoenix Hill pieces. Would you like them? And I said, well, yeah. How, how would you like to give them, take pictures and let us see if they're Phoenix Hill made? And uh, this person was unreal. I mean, two FedEx boxes showed up at my front door. We didn't want them sitting on the street in town because we're only open two days a week. And she shipped them to my home. And, and spent like 80 or $90 to ship them to us. Didn't want to be reimbursed. But we went through and of the uh, 45 pieces, um, only about 15 were Phoenix Hill made. But some of them were made by Wedgwood in England, others made by uh, Arsenal Pottery in Trenton, uh, a couple others by uh, two of the potteries in Ohio. And, it, and we now have a, a section of one of our showcases of examples of majolica made elsewhere in the United States and in the world. Uh, there were hundreds of companies made these. A lot of them made this material, but a lot of them didn't last very long. Um, the Phoenix Hill Company is featured. In fact, the International Exhibits produced a three volume book as a companion piece. Um, uh, if you drop it on your foot, you'll know it because it's three volumes and costs over $300 uh, as a contributor to the uh, exhibit, um, they donated a set to us, thank goodness, so we didn't have to pay for it. And there's a 45 page section in volume two on the history of the Phoenix Hill Company. And it's quite, quite well written. Um, other questions, the bus trip to the museum. We're still kicking that around as to whether that's practical. Uh, we did talk about when the original timetable came out, the museum exhibit was going to open in Baltimore. And we, we, were, we were talking about a trip to Baltimore from Phoenixville, which is a little more practical than going to New York City. But that's, that's still under discussion. Um, any other questions I see? I don't see any. All right, anybody else? Well, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, you're welcome to stop in and take a look at our co collection Wednesdays and Fridays from nine to three. Just ring the doorbell. Great. Thank That's you, Jack. All Thanks right, for thank your time tonight. Thank you for inviting me, Mark. Take care. All right. Good night, everybody. Have a good summer, Jack. Thank you. you. Take care.